afternoon, and thank you for joining the Superior Health Quality Alliance Nursing Homes Leadership Roundtable, where we're continuing our ser series, Turning Your Deficiencies into Efficiencies. Today is all about F0656, care planning and assessments and resident-centric care planning. My name is Constance Stetrov, and I'm a quality improvement advisor with Superior Health Quality Alliance. And I am accompanied by several of my colleagues, Ms. Tabitha, Margaret, and Ms. Mikeisha will be assisting us with the chat and putting in questions if there is any. They'll also offer you the links that we have available and provide you with the link to this PDF. We're also joined by our guest speakers, Ms. Jana Botton and Ms. Kim Heft. We host these one-hour sessions on the second and the fourth Wednesday of the month. The first half is a didactic presentation and the remaining time will be for questions and answers. The presentation link was just dropped into the chat momentarily, as well as we're going to um, populate two polling questions that um, we are assisting with um, another organization that had questions about these. So they would like to get your answers on these. Please feel free to use the chat box to share any comments, questions, and even resources during the presentation. Besides learning from our speakers, we learn from each other and our peers. Towards the end of today's event, we will also put an evaluation link in the chat that will only take you one to two minutes to complete. We use your evaluations and feedback to give you a better experience. Please help me in welcoming all of our guests and we look forward to sharing your knowledge and experience with us today. The floor is all yours, Ms. Jana and Ms. Kim. Hello everyone. Oh my gosh, it's really nice to be back. I have not been here for a while. So hello, Roundtable team. It's nice to be here again. Um, I'm here again with Jana Bond. She also will be presenting here on care planning today. Um, for our objectives, we are going to be reviewing the F tags associated with care planning. So go right ahead and put it to the next, um, the next slide, please. Here we go, perfect. We're going to review the F tags associated with care planning. We're going to understand the interdisciplinary team's role in care planning. We're going to learn how to create person-centered care plans and how to individualize generic care plans. And lastly, we're going to discuss strategies on how to create a culture that values the importance of a care plan. So Jana, why don't you take it away and advance to the next slide, please. Thank you, Kim, for that warm introduction. So we're, I'm going to kick us off by talking about F655, the baseline care plan. And um, we're using these F tags as kind of the point of reference to go back to the basics and learn the expectations that the federal government CMS has put out there for us. And care planning seems to be one that people get, they struggle with. And um, this is something that I think it's just good to reflect back on and look at. So what does F655 tell us? It tells us that the facility has to develop and implement a baseline care plan. And that that care plan um, has to include the instructions needed to provide effective and person-centered care of the resident that meet professional standards of quality of care. And the caveat is that it has to be done in 48 hours. So if within 48 hours of admission, you have to have a care plan in place for your resident that includes the following minimums. Um, goals based on your admission orders, physician orders, dietary, therapy, social services, and um, a little known fact, the PASAR has to have, if there's any recommendations from their PASAR, that needs to be included in your baseline care plan. That is under F655. So when we go and we talk about um, what does it mean to have person-centered, what does a person-centered care plan mean? And really, when we think about um, when I think about this, and I'm a social worker, by the way, from background, so I look at things through that lens often, and I, I look at it from the perspective of the patient, and I know clinical does too, but I look at it from the psychosocial well-being aspect. That's kind of the disciplinary look at that you use when you're a social worker. And what is the intent of the stay? That's always the first thing that I would look at. What is the intent of the stay for this person coming into the nursing facility? Do they intend to come in for a short term to rehab, get back to their baseline health care level and leave our facility and go back to their prior level of living? Or is it unknown? Do we really not know? Did they just experience an acute episode 
or a chronic episode that left them in a situation where maybe they can't go back to that prior level of care. They really don't want to stay in the nursing home, but we really don't know what's going to happen. Or is the intent that they were admitted with the, with the need for long-term care? Because identifying that first and foremost is really going to help you set up your person-centered care plan from the perspective and the lens of what that resident is thinking and needing and wanting for the outcomes of their care. So one thing I do want to talk about, though, when we look at the slide and we think about um, dietary, I think it's really critical, and this is a misstep that I see and I've experienced a lot in facilities, that we miss dietary preferences on that baseline care plan or dietary needs based on culture or religion. And facilities often get care plan tags. When you look at the F tags and you see those F tags related to care planning, it's often that we miss either food preferences, a dietary preference like vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, or it's a religious diet or just basic food preferences and we're not meeting the needs of the resident because we didn't identify it on that baseline care plan and boy, golly, if you mess with somebody's food, you're going to hear about it, right? And you're going to hear about it loudly, and it's going to generate some complaints. So getting dietary involved in that baseline care plan, I think that's a misstep that a lot of facilities may miss out on that can really be critical to getting um, a person-centered care plan. The other thing I want to talk about um, is the PASAR. The PASAR forms um, which is that pre-admission screening and resident review form, which is level one, level two, some states call them. They have form numbers like 3877, 3878 in Michigan. That form historically guides what care a resident who ha may have intellectual or developmental disabilities or a mental illness. And by completing that form and making sure that that form was completed accurately, um, how many show hands, right, have had forms come from the hospital that are inaccurate because they didn't take the time to really complete that passer form? So as a social worker, it's critical, and as a nurse, MDS nurse, nurse doing that baseline of care plan, to make sure that that PASAR form was completed correctly and that if there's identifying things on that form, for example, um, intellectual disabilities, patient participates in a PACE program or a program offsite um, based on you know, services outside of the community because of the answers or whatever information is on that PASAR form, it's critical that that hits your baseline care plan. So just um, going back and looking at the F655 tag, these are some of those basic things that need to be included on that baseline. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So when we talk about um, the 48 hours and it meets the requirements outlined in the guidance, and here's the next part of F655, it's a big F tag. The facility must provide the resident and or their representative with a summary of the baseline care plan. Did you know that? So if your baseline care plan is done at 48 hours, but you don't have your care plan review with the family for until day 10, you're technically out of compliance. That resident and resident's representative need to be involved in that 48-hour initial baseline care plan. You want to make sure that you've gotten it right for that patient coming into your building. And this is especially critical if you have somebody that's only going to be in your building for a 10 to 14-day stay. We know that short-term stays are getting shorter and shorter. So that baseline care plan um, is critical to the resident and the resident representatives. And we wanna make sure that it really mirrors what it is, A, that they're here for, and B, that they want to achieve by their stay here in the nursing home. And it identifies their personal needs and wants of the care and services, the types of treatment that we're gonna be providing for them. And that's what it means to be person-centered. So um, we talk about minimum health care information to properly care for the resident immediately upon their admission. When I was trained on care planning back in the dark ages in the 1990s, when we did this on paper, <laughs> so, and everything was paper, I know some of you weren't even born yet, but back in the dark ages, when we did this, I was trained by a nurse who told me, Jana, your care plan needs to be picked up. The purpose of the care plan is that if we have somebody new coming in to care for Mary Sue, Mary Sue's our resident, tomorrow, that that care plan is the instruction guide on how to carry 
care for Mary Sue from head to toe. That I can pick up that care plan and it is going to meet the needs of Mary Sue the way she wants and desires her care and services and treatments to be provided by us in the nursing home. And that conversation, I can still picture her. Her name was Bobby Jo. She was our MDS nurse. I can picture her telling me that because that was critical information that have, I've kept with me. And I think if you're training new staff on completing a care plan, using that logic and that conversation to really identify and kind of draw that picture or create that image of what the purpose of a care plan is, it's not busy work, right? It's intentional work that we do to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the resident from head to toe and everything that we do. And the other part of that is the resident needs to have the input. So when we talk about what input does the resident need? It's their initial goals. It's a summary of their medications and dietary instructions. Medications. How many times do residents go to the hospital and they get med changes? And then they come to you and they're like, but that's not my medication. That's not what I'm on. I don't take that. Why am I on that? And no one has explained to them or they haven't done a good and thorough assessment or identification or understanding that meds have been changed. And we need to care plan that. We need to look at that and consider that and add that to that baseline care plan. And then services and treatments that are administered by the facility and personnel. And then finally, any updated information um, based on the details of the comprehensive care plan as necessary. So when we think about baseline care plan, I think about it as your roadmap. It's your guidebook to the patient, to the client, to the resident, to the elder. And getting it right is very, very important. And we only have 48 hours, right, to get that initiated. 48 hours. So you know, some things that um, I see when we look at F tags and we look at a lot of F tags, I work on the directed plans of correction and we read a lot of 2567s. And when we're reading citations, some of the, the pitfalls that I see are A, we use a generic care plan, cut and paste, and we use it for everybody. So it's not personalized for our baseline care plan. We fail to evaluate transfer status we fail to evaluate transfer status because they come in on a Friday and our therapy team is gone. So the, so the resident or client waits until Monday to get a transfer status because we haven't figured that out and we don't care plan it. Um, we don't meet dietary needs. I mentioned that before, huge, huge issue. And finally, we don't talk about discharge planning with the patient. So I want you to think about yourself being a resident in the bed and you know somebody's coming in to provide care for you and you get admitted on a Friday and it's now Sunday and you haven't seen a therapist and you want to go home. Like you want to go home and no one has talked to you about what that picture looks like of how you're going to get home. How anxious or scared would you be on a Sunday night? How freaked out would you be after 48 hours of not having a conversation that you desperately want to have and no one being able to provide you those answers? So when you think about your baseline care plan, I think it's critical to really listen to what the resident's goal is and to make sure that you have frequent conversations and you've educated your staff on what those conversations are about their baseline care plan and their goals. So next slide, please. So F656, and we talk about develop and implement a comprehensive care plan. So here's the baseline. Now we move into the comprehensive care plan. So Jana, what's the difference? What's the difference, right? So the baseline is that immediate. The comprehensive is everything, everything that we've done on our assessments. It is our psychosocial needs. It is a trauma-informed care assessment. It is discharge planning, you know, besides just saying resident states, they want to go home. It's where home is. What does home need? How does that look? And how are we going to get them there? It is all the services that are going to be provided and offered to attain or maintain their highest practical physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being. And then any services that are required but not provided to, due to the resident's exercise of rights, including the right to refuse treatment. So if a resident refuses treatment, but we know that they need X, Y, and Z, if they want, you know, we feel healthcare-wise that they're going to need um, XYZ treatment, but they're refusing it, they have the right to refuse it, but you have to care plan it and you have to document it. And it has to be in their care plan as to why the patient or client or family is stating that refusing that treatment. 
and then any specialized services or specialized rehab services that you'll provide because of the PASAR recommendations, mental health services. Kid you not, behavioral health care um, citations are right up there. We're seeing behavioral health care service needs not being met. I know nursing homes are struggling to get behavioral health care. There are complete pockets of the three states that we provide care in where you cannot get psychiatric services. This is a critical need for our residents. So if you're admitting somebody into your building that is going to need psychiatric services, psychological services, medication adjustments done uh, with, the, you know, with the support of psychiatric services and you don't have them available, you need to figure out how that's going to be met because you're going to have an unmet need for that resident because care plan wise, they're going to need it. The PASAR gives you that direction. The same for developmental and intellectual disabilities. If a patient um, comes in and they trigger a level two and that level two comes back stating that they need to be moved to a lesser environment, you should be care planning and coordinating that discussion of discharge and extra services provided to them by your community mental health authority or whatever uh, community source or resource or organization is providing that service outside of your facility and they need to be part of that care planning conversation about what it looks like for that client to get back to their prior level of care and services out in the community. Obviously the resident's goal for admission and desired outcomes and the preferences and potential for future discharge. And I highlighted this um, because it must be culturally competent and trauma informed. And what does culturally competent mean? So let's go to the next slide. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. So this was added Oh gosh, Kim, I'm trying to think, but four or five years ago, culturally competent trauma-informed care, it might have been longer than that, six, seven years ago. But we're starting to see um, an uptick on citations with trauma-informed and culturally competent um, care planning being tagged. And the pitfalls, again, that I see are care plans that don't meet the religious diversity, the ethnic diversity, cultural needs, people that identify you know, their sexual orientation, um, not being care plans, not being discussed, not being needs, not being met. And it's being driven, those, a lot of those F tags are being driven by complaints from residents and their families or outside uh, associations because the facility failed to meet those culturally competent needs. Trauma-informed care, um, I think, I just would really encourage you to look at the education that you're doing with your staff on trauma-informed care. Trauma isn't just uh, physical or verbal or sexual abuse that happened to somebody in their childhood. I think if you were to go ask your staff right now, what is trauma? I think you'd be surprised at what the understanding of what trauma-informed care is and what it is not. And so I think it's really important that you look at your education, your competencies. This is something that your staff are required to have competency around in the new facility assessment. Um, it's more than a one and done education. This should be embedded in your education and the resources that you create for your staff around uh, trauma, around cultural competency and what it means to be culturally competent when providing care for residents. And then what kinds of things can be triggering or non-triggering um, for residents with a trauma history or an identified trauma. And how do you care plan that? What does that look like? How do you assess for that? How are you assessing for that? Are you even really doing more than, you know, the clipboard conversation, you know, blah, 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 and not really having a conversation. If I were to ask all of us to think back to something that was traumatic for us in our lives, we could probably all come up with something. But would that something be, would you be willing to share it to a stranger who comes into your bedroom with a clipboard on day two of your stay at a nursing home? Would you trust them with that information? So, when we're assessing and care planning around trauma-informed care, I want to caution you that you need to make sure that your staff have a good understanding and training of how to complete that assessment and then what to include and not to include in a care plan for that resident's safety and what that resident gives permission to. So the resident does drive that bus, right? We need to make sure that we're having that conversation with our staff. All right, next slide, please. So then it brings us to F657, care plan timing and revision. 
Again, a baseline care plan and your full care plan um, timelines, you need to have it developed within seven days of completion of the comprehensive assessment and no more than 21 days after admission. That's a mouthful. Your MDS nurses know what that means. So if you have a comprehensive assessment done on day 14, that care plan better be complete and in the chart by day 21. It needs to be prepared with an interdisciplinary approach. It needs to have multiple people involved, including dietary, and these are called out in the FTAG, dietary, nursing, including input from direct care staff who work with the resident and your attending physician. How many of you included your physician in your care plans? I don't remember doing that other than maybe psychiatry, and that was really just obtaining orders and treatment, but your attending physician should be involved in your care plan. And then obviously resident, resident representative. And those are from um, the actual FTAG language. So we go to the next slide, please. So this is where we're gonna transition to Kim, but I wanna talk a little bit, just to kind of give you the synopsis about person-centered care plans. It assesses for clinical problems and risks related to that specific resident and that specific resident's wants, needs, identified desires and outcomes. It involves the resident and their family. It identifies their goals. Their goals may, may be unrealistic to you and I. They may be, I want to go home, and you know that, you know, critically looking at the resident's condition, you're like, golly, I don't know if that's going to happen. But that's their goal, right? That's still their goal. They have the right to state their goal, and we have to honor their request for that goal. It understands the resident's preferences. I prefer to drink coffee for breakfast, and that's all I drink between 8 o'clock and noon. True story. I drink that in water. I don't eat much breakfast. So preferences for my care plan would be skip breakfast, give her coffee, right? When you think about your own preferences compared to what you're providing to residents, how are you identifying those, and are you really actually following your preferences? Develop resident-specific interventions. If a resident needs something or has a desired, out, you want a desired outcome for the resident, what can you do to make an intervention resident specific? It could be, for example, being left-handed. If a resident is left-handed, how are you going to give them devices? How are you going to set up things for them? You know, when they come to the table, how are you going to set them up for success being specific to that resident? So think about things like vision, hearing, mobility, behavior, mood state, preferences identified. And then finally, review your care plan regularly and often and update it. New information comes at you frequently about residents, especially on admission. Maybe one daughter tells you one thing and a son comes in and tells you something different. Never happens, right? They give two different versions of mom's story. But when you look at all of those versions that you're getting, somewhere in the middle, you're getting a more clear picture of who your resident was, who they are to their families, and what the expectations are. So, with that, I'm going to switch it over to Kim. There's a lot of information in those F-tags, by the way. There's like 24 pages of information on those F-tags, condensed into like, what, 15 minutes. So I know we'll have questions. Go ahead, Kim. Thanks, Jana. Yeah, that was really good. Uh, please go to the next slide. Okay, so here's my question to you. You can put it in chat. You can think about it, whatever you'd like. No pressure, but if I entered your facility and asked a nurse who is responsible for the care planning process, what would they tell me? Would they say the nurse assessment coordinator or your MDS nurse that, yep, she does everything with the care plans? Or would they say, you know, it's the interdisciplinary team? Or, or I would really like them to say, hey, I update care plans all the time. That would be a great answer too. In some facilities, the care planning process is the responsibility of one person, the NAC, the nurse assessment coordinator. It, no, please don't. No, that's not the right answer, though. This is really an inadequate practice. This care plan, we know it's a dynamic process. It's ever changing. So when a resident's need changes, like let's, let's just use a fall. Staff should implement new interventions and update that care plan and reflect these changes. And I say fall because that's one that, right, interventions need to be immediate. And these include these changes that occur after hours and on weekends. So if your NAC is the only person who's updating these care plans, 
facilities aren't going to be able to update in a timely manner. That's going to be a problem for you. So think about who that role is, who's doing all of the care planning. Next slide. Now, you've heard, you've heard this before. Jana just said in regards to F657 in Appendix PP of the Psalm, it states that a resident's comprehensive care plan must be reviewed and revised by the interdisciplinary team for each assessment, including both a comprehensive and quarterly review assessments. And additionally, it states the staff must revise the care plan on a changing on changing goals, preferences, and needs of the resident in response to current, current interventions. Remember the IDT includes your floor nurses and your aides. They're the ones that care for the residents and they know their needs better than anyone else. So make sure you're applying their knowledge for the resident's benefit. Slide. Happen when a care plan is revised by only the nurse assessment coordinator and not the entire team. Well, you're going to have some miscommunication with staff, most likely. You're going to have increased risk for residents. So if, like, if a resident falls, the intervention's not updated timely, oh boy, that's a big risk for that resident. You could have poor quality care because of interventions and strategies that we're not all aware of. And that's, of course, we know you're going to have survey citations and possibly litigation, which we definitely want to avoid that too when all possible. Next slide, please. All right, so there's no specific strategy that spells out how to ensure that the changing resident care needs are being captured and then revised on the care plan, but there are some things you can consider to strengthen your care plans. Number one, review your 24-hour reports. You know, pay attention to falls, new medications, infections, anything unusual, like unusual changes in condition. Review your physician orders, your therapy notes, your social work notes, dietary, all your IDT notes for potential changes in residents. What are you doing at meetings? <laughs> I know it sounds funny. Are you paying attention? But to what level, right? your care plan meetings, your huddles, your IDT, uh, to pull out, pull out those changes in condition when you're talking to, talking in your meetings. And actually even your informal resident and family conversations, listen, listen for those subtle changes that might be something to, that is identified for a new goal or an intervention. Rounds, are you making your rounds? You wanna talk with your staff and your residents Again, yes, I'm repeating, look and listen for those resident changes. Couldn't help but say, but talk to your resident. That's the person that's going to guide, right? They're the ones, that's the number one person guiding their care is the resident. Um, but be leery, Jana mentioned this about uh, your care plan templates. So I'll call them generic, um, generic care plans. You don't solely wanna rely on them because they, they're just giving you your standard problems, goals, interventions, and then guideliding the care plan um, process, right? You have to individualize them. And we're gonna talk about that here in a second. And then of course, update in a timely manner. That is how you're gonna capture these changing needs for your resident. Next slide, please. Generic care plans. I do believe, they have a place, but they can get you into trouble. If you're not individualizing them, they're gonna produce poor resident outcomes and multiple other issues. So simple start to individualizing that generic care plan, yeah, involve your resident. And check the resident's goals and preferences that they're person-centered, they're their goals. And also, does your policy and procedure, do they support care, care care plan compliance. Who's looking at these generic care plans to ensure that they're individualized? And also create a culture that values the importance of a care plan. That is essential. 
if it's worth looking at, it's worth using, right? I, I've heard, I'm going to be honest with you. I have worked somewhere before where I've heard people say, I never look at the care plans. They don't tell me anything. Well, what's that telling you then? Your care plans are not person-centered and following resident, the resident's plan or the resident's goal of care. And lastly, identify your root causes if, of the issues that you're having with your care plans or your overall care planning, and then implement your solution. Next, please. All right, we're gonna dive into an example of a generic care of a generic care plan found in an electronic health records care plan library. Here's just a basic scenario. A resident spilled hot coffee on her lap, resulting in a first degree burn. Now this resident, this, I mean, this generic care plan that they picked out of the library is the resident has the potential actual impairment of the specified location related to burn. And then under that generic care plan is one, two, what do we have? Four goals here, okay? Number one, be leery of your brackets. Are you teaching your staff, that inter, interdisciplinary team? What do you do with brackets? What should go in there? Or little symbols, I've seen triangles before. What does a triangle mean? Does that mean I need to put in some, um, some individualized uh, information on that generic care plan. These are things that your staff needs to know. And then when it comes to that goal, are you teaching them? Yes, choose every goal or choose two of the goals or choose all of them. What, what is your direction? Or actually is the direction is to actually choose the one goal that most identifies with that resident's plan of care and their outcomes. Next slide, please. Okay. Then under this one generic care plan, holy cow, look at all these interventions for this resident burn. Okay, here's the resident's burn and all these things I can choose from. Do we choose all these or do we just choose the ones that really pertain to the resident? The next slide, please. Yeah, these are the rest of the care, I mean, the rest of the interventions. I think there's like 15 of them. And um, I have seen all 15 chosen. And then I'm like, hmm, she had a burn, but actually um, we don't use a draw sheet or a lifting device to move the resident. So it's, again, thinking about your interventions, training your staff on which ones to best utilize for each individual person. Next slide, please. All right, here's the revised care plan. Now, I didn't give you much information except that the resident um, spilled coffee and had a first degree burn on her uh, left thigh. First degree burn, by the way, just very, it's just superficial. It's gonna be red. It might be a little hot to touch for the resident. It might be a little sore no open skin. I just wanted to put that out there in case somebody thought like, you're not, this is all you're doing for your resident. So it's very minor. So the focus is the resident has impaired skin integrity to the left thigh related to a first degree burn. Do you see, we individualized it. We made it impaired, not at risk, or I forgot what the other word was. And we said where it is specified. Then we chose one goal. One goal, the resident's first degree burn on her left thigh will be healed by review date. And now here's a few interventions that mean something. We're gonna follow the facility's protocols for treatment and monitoring of injury. Don't need it in my care plan. I got that on the TAR or the MAR or wherever that information is. And I talked to my resident. The resident wants to wear a gown and no long pants while she's in bed. The, the, the scratchy, I don't know, whatever is bothering her. But when she's in her chair, she just wants to wear those light cotton pants. As you can see, we're just individualizing what that resident wants when she got this burn on her left thigh. Now she does have a little pain. So yeah, we're gonna assess her pain and treat as ordered. Don't need to put what the treatment is, but we're gonna treat as ordered. I can deal with this care 
plan. It's to the point, tells me what to do for my resident that has a first degree burn on her left thigh. Now, yes, I'm leaving out. Who knows what else it could be? Someone may have asked me though that, oh, but wait, do you, are you going to use like, are you going to put a, a top on her coffee cup now or what, or are you going to put a pad on her lap? Yeah, maybe I am, but this probably isn't the right care plan for it. That's going to be in a different care plan, correct? Those type of interventions. Okay, next slide, please. Generic care plans, then you kind of have overly specific care plans. Ones that have no flexibility in them, they're overwhelming for your staff, and you are at risk of noncompliance. So let me give you a couple of examples. So on the next slide, overly specific care plans, keep the plan simple and direct. Now, this is an example of something that has no flexibility and risk of noncompliance. Maybe the, inter the, the intervention put in the care plan is to check the resident's glucose every Wednesday and Saturday before every meal. A better option would be to check the resident's glucose twice weekly. Do you see how you're stuck in, in doing it on those days? and how you could be at risk for um, non-compliance. Think about your wording for that. The next slide, here's an example of overwhelming interventions in a care plan and how to revise them. Um, fall care plans are notorious for this issue, right? The resident, a resident that has a lot of falls, we keep trying to make new interventions, putting them in, putting them in one after another, and soon you have a laundry list of, of interventions. So first thing I would do, review your existing interventions before adding some new. Now this is a short list for our purposes here, but here's an example of keep, here's an intervention, keep your door open, keep door open at night so resident can see going to the bathroom, put fall mat at bedside, and call light next to resident's right side when in bed, and door to stay open at night. Revise your interventions. Easier to read, keep your fall mat at the bedside, place that call light on the resident's right side, and keep that resident's door at bed, open at bedtime. Um, so look at your, look at care plans that have too much information. You are gonna overwhelm your staff, and they're not gonna use that resident's plan of care because it's too hard to read. All right, next slide, please. So how do you get your team involved in care planning? Those that don't look at the care plan, how are you going to get that team involved? First of all, set your expectation. If your team understands exactly what is being expected, it's gonna reduce your confusion and also be sure the expectations you set are attainable. You know, there's always going to be an emergent situation, but but then what's the backup for updating the care plan? So if your expectation is the nurse is going to immediately put the care plan, um, the intervention in the care plan before the end of shift or whatever your process is, um, have a backup. Got to be it's got to be um, attainable. And reinforce and hold your staff accountable frequently. Then you want to provide your training, train the staff on the care plan process and what each person's role is going to be. Um, you can make it lectures, role-playing, hands-on training. Use these type of examples uh, for your staff. Make sure they understand like those things, like what brackets are and, um, and areas they need to personalize in a care plan. Provide your resources. Who is your point people that the staff can go for help? Maybe it's your, your nurse coordinator, your, I mean, your NAC, nursing assessment coordinator, and um, you or someone that's really good on care planning on each shift that they can use as resources. Or maybe you have other tools during your training that you can provide them as resources. Your electronic health records have care planning resource built right in there. Show them, show them where those are. Um, communicate. That's the key to care planning. Encourage your staff to engage with the residents, communicate to staff to update their care plans. Be sure they know how to access the care plan 
and how to foster a culture where the staff feel comfortable relaying these problems and then of course work through these issues until they feel comfortable. And feedback, 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 good or bad, keep everyone on the same page. Boy, yeah, this is a lot to do, isn't it? But if you are consistent in this process, you are gonna have good care plans, care plans that tell the story of the resident and staff that follow them. Slide. Elaborate a little bit here on communication challenges. Yeah, they're, oh my gosh, communication challenges, they are real. And once a challenge is identified, you can then of course develop strategies to be put in place to improve them. So here's your, here's what I think are some of your challenges. You probably will be able to relate, I hope. Um, well, actually, I hope you don't relate to these, but I think I picked the right ones here. Staff turnover and agency. That's a communication challenge, not for care planning for many things. How do they know where to look? How are they trained on where to find the interventions and goals for your residents? Language barriers go both ways. That goes with staff and residents and staff to staff, staff resident. What I say to someone, they may not understand or may take it the wrong way. That's a, that's so, but that's another um, a, that's another uh, quality improvement project on its own. Sometimes, um, are your staff overloaded with their assignment? Yeah, a tough one, right? But but if they are, what do you do with your care plans and your interventions if they can't get to them? get to those to those interventions who's that backup who's doing it and staff buy-in right if you you know was that the peanuts character that you know the teachers going blah 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 if the staff does not buy in on your goals let's just say no i we don't we can't do care planning and you're talking to them but they don't buy in they hear blah 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 so setting that culture of um, communication and why this is important is 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 just an, an essential need for this. And then your technology. Uh, communication technology is great, but how do you best communicate with resident staff and family? And then what about your complex processes? And I'll talk about that here on the next slide. So yeah, the complex process. Sometimes I want to talk about this kind of like, where's the breakdown? You know, when determining the breakdown for a care planning issue, let's start, of course, with, with uncovering that root cause of an issue. And a lot of times it's due to that poorly designed process. There's too many steps or it's too complicated, a lot of redundancy. Literally take a team um, of different, different, uh, take an IDT, and of different aspects of it and break down your process. You're gonna see talking to them, oh my gosh, why are we doing this five times? Take that out, let's streamline and do this. You'll have better compliance and um, buy-in from staff when they're part of those decisions and it's easy. Also, the, where's the breakdown? It could be because of that lack of those needed resources. So before you're implementing it, make sure you got those needed resources. We already talked about um, insufficient staff. Um, it's a tough one having having enough people, but do they have the necessary competencies? Sometimes just having the staff that knows what to do and is competent is better than people that don't know what the, what they're doing. And lastly, look at your policy and procedure. Do they require more than what the regulation requires? Is it unrealistic? Um, is it no longer current with the clinical evidence or, you know, is it hard to understand? I guess that kind of goes a little bit with that poorly designed processes, looking at this when um, we have breakdowns in our care planning. If you, if you haven't noticed, this isn't even just about care planning, a breakdown in anything you're doing, right, in your nursing home. Next one, thank you. All righty, care plan audits. So, got to audit to see if you're doing this right. Yeah. So audit for completion times, right? Are your care plans being completed on time? Are, is the participation of the required and appropriate additional IDT members? 
Um, are they in there? Are they, you know what, going back to the completion times, you have to uh, make sure that your IDT is reviewing um, with every assessment. Go to your electronic health record. They have a report. Many have a report on seeing if everyone signed off their review on their care plan. Uh, get your family and resident involved. Look to see if your care plans um, show that involvement. And um, also do audits on the reviews with effectiveness care plan reviews with effectiveness and revisions. Did those revisions and goals, yeah, were they effective? And then lastly, I kind of like this one. I really, I don't know why I like doing this one, but the, the resident environmental room and device review, I know that's a mouthful. That's not probably what I would totally call that. But what I'm getting at here is go into your resident room, write down, everything you see, all the equipment, the devices, go in their bathroom, what they need, then go back to the care plan and see if that care plan reflects what you see in the resident's room on the resident. Everything that has to do with the resident, I will guarantee you, you are going to have an eye-opening experience on that one. That is for sure. But you're going to learn a lot and make sure that the, it'll help make sure that your residents are getting the care they want. And oh, yes. And then these are, of course, our resources. Um, nothing uh, eye opening here. It's your state operations, operations manual, appendix PP, the MDS. And lastly, the Pioneer Network. This is the national leader of the culture change movement. So even if it's not just getting buy in from the staff about how to uh, make a culture change of improvement for uh, care planning, it's for culture change in general. And I think you might really um, like the uh, this link here and the different strategies uh, for culture change. There we go. And uh, so I guess we're open for any type of questions or comments or whatever you have for Jana and myself. Thank you so much for pre presenting on this. Um, what would you say is the best um, solution for reviewing all those care plans? Let's say a facility has multiple very generic care plans. How do they develop a plan to get them more resident centric? Because you can't do all of them at once, right? Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, Jana and I, I mean, we can tag team this. And the first thing though, I would say is Start with a care plan that is used often, like oh, falls. I don't know. Falls has just always been such a, uh, it, it just is. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. one of those areas where take that fall care plan and, and depending on how many residents you have, my mind is set to a very large um, resident population. So I would have started with one wing of 30 residents and their care plans for falls and looking at that generic care plan and seeing what I see on that hallway. And you know what, you might learn too, it might look different on a different hallway. And think mm -hmm. about that too, because you may learn, you got some champions on hallway A that could help on hallway F or something of that nature. Do you, do you wanna back that up with anything, Jana? I was just gonna say, and then take it to Quapi to celebrate. Yes, you know, I would involve and look at what Kim's point is, look at your data. And if you do have care plans that are really good being person-centered and it's just organically happening because you've got a couple of dynamic people involved driving that process, use them to educate others on what they did. Um, you know, another option too, like dining, like the food preference one, getting those, <laughs> Just take the ones that you know are going to be high impact, high impact care plans, falls, dietary, behavior, mood, you know, what it is that your culture of your building needs the most. And that's where I would start. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Great. Great answer, too. And I, I appreciate that you talk about um, involving your staff as a collective from the CNAs, dietary staff, and so forth, and keeping it very simple. Um, when we talk about, um, especially CNAs from a day-to-day -day standpoint, um, reviewing um, the care plan, sometimes we have questions around the changes that happen so quickly 
with um, a, a change of condition for our resident. Um, it could be for the transfer status is a specific one that really uh, can get facilities in, in a um, in an issue. So how do you talk about making sure that that communication is um, being uh, talked to when there's the nurse or the uh, IDT and so forth? How do you translate all of that so that it doesn't um, fall through the cracks when there is a change at the bedside from what the CNA is seeing or the dietary staff, what they're seeing, or even your um, activities director, they may be seeing something different. So how do we make sure that communication is still flowing to make sure that the care plan reflects some of those changes that can happen within a few minutes? I think you're, you know, absolutely using huddles at the beginning and end of your shift. I think those shift huddles, the shift to shift that I, I don't know what happened, but, uh, you know, that seems to bond. It's coming back, which is exciting for me because that's the purpose of those shift to shift are to communicate changes in condition or potential changes that you've noted from your shift to the next shift so that they can be aware um, of things that have happened. And I think utilizing the shift to shift huddle is really important. I also think, you know, some type of alert. I know we use EMRs and a lot of them will have an alert that you have to click through. And you often will find staff just sitting there clicking and you'll be like, what did you just read? And they can't tell you because they're just clicking. So taking a step back and giving them the time to really pay attention to some of those changes. And I don't know, Kim, what do you have to say? I mean, I just think the shift to shift huddles are huge, being that shift to shift report. Yeah, it, it, you know what, it, because you, actually you get the verbalization where you're like eye contact, are you paying attention to me, right, about what I'm saying? I I do think electronic health records have, oh my God, the functionality is like great, but you have to really embed that in your staff that if you see this alert with this there or what have you, because that's your, that's your procedure, that's your policy, that when a new transfer um, a new transfer status is initiated, you put an alert in the, the, their plan of care that, you know, that's bold, it's red or what I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things you can do, but they all need to know that and they all need to buy in. And that's, hey, we actually had that. We thought we had the answer to something like that, what I'm describing. We brought the CNAs in and they're like, no, this isn't how we're doing it. If you, yeah, it was, and they, wasn't so much about alerts in um, in a electronic health record. They were all about the communication like between each other. And I know we had a thing like, well, what if you're not on that hall like normal? And I don't even remember what we did anymore. But but we had we brought the staff in and they figured out how to best communicate with each other, even if they're not like consistent staff or agency. So bring them in. They will they'll help you out on things like this. Thank you for answering that. And my, my next question really has to do with those unrealistic um, care plans. And sometimes those are driven by families or residents. Um, I remember a specific one when um, COVID came around and we were trying to offer vaccinations and so forth. A family said, we want it in the chart. Do never, never ask mom whether she wants it or not. This is what we want to do. And so can you please put this as part of a care plan? Well, we know with the rules, the CMS and so forth, you have to reapproach. So how do you handle those unrealistic um, requests from families when it comes to care planning? I think it's it's a nuanced approach on that. I think you have to explain, you know, like, look, here's the rules. Here's the black and white. Here's what we can do. We will put in mom's care plan for family's request. We are not going to approach mom with the request for vaccines. However, we're going to approach the family. Yeah. <laughs> okay, family, yeah. we can do this, but somebody still needs to be asked. And you're going to get these requests every year and you're going to have to say no. It's just, it's the rule. For mom to be here, for us to care for mom effectively and to meet the requirements of the federal regulations that require payment to get payment for Medicare for mom's stay or Medicaid for mom's stay, these are the rules we have to abide by. So here's how we're gonna, here's how we're gonna do this to help make it so that we're not putting the stress on the resident by asking her multiple times for your request about vaccines, but you're gonna take that burden off of your mom as the family. And you know, sometimes families like side rails, let's just talk about bed rails, right? The bed rail request, how many restraints? It's a lot of education, it's a lot of training, you know. Um, I lived through taking restraints off of residents back in the late 90s, early 2000s. A lot of 
a lot of us went through that. And it was a very scary time and a lot of education and a lot of just learning about what it was that families were really afraid of and just exploring with them. What is your biggest fear? Mom's going to fall and she's going to get hurt. Okay. But mom can fall and get hurt worse if she climbs over the side of a bed rail and hits her head because now she's up higher, right? So let's talk about the risk. And it's just really, to Kim's point, it's developing that culture of open communication and honesty about the expectations. I can't guarantee that your mom's not going to fall and get hurt coming into a nursing home. Nobody can guarantee that. We can't, we can't guarantee that. And by putting a restraint on somebody, we're not going to guarantee that. It's just false hope that we're offering. So, you know, I think it's, it's those kind of conversations. Um, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard for staff, but empowering your staff to be understanding and respectful and to be just really empathetic listeners and to really dig into what is it that the family is really looking at or the residents responsible parties driving for, I think will get you a lot farther in some of your conversations. It's building that rapport with your families. I mean, I think of how many times mom needed an antibiotic, but mom really didn't have any criteria to meet it, um, meet the need for an antibiotic. So just having those conversations and talking through those points, I think that our families pick up a lot more every time we have those conversations. It's not going to be all the first time they understand everything, right? So sometimes it's having those conversations over and over and, and definitely having that transparency. Yes. I'm trying to think of other things that does anybody else have questions that they might issues in your facility with your care plans or um, things you'd like advisement on? I don't see anything on the yeah. I did um, put out those polling results. Thank you all for voting on the polls. I did share the um, results. It looked like about 50, 42% of you um, still can continue to mandate the influence of vaccination for staff, allowing for me medical and religious exemptions. I'm really interested in that answer. About 58% of you um, do not. I um, don't know if maybe that changed around COVID um, after that mandation that there was more resistance or not. Um, that's, it's a very interesting response. And then do you follow the same strategy you use for COVID-19 outbreaks if you were to have an influenza outbreak and 58% of you said yes. Um, and about 8% of you said no. And then uh, there's a somewhat, and that's about 33%. I really appreciate all those people that answered those questions. It's gonna help us to um, help another facility that did have those questions for us. Um, my Keisha dropped into the chat. I just wanna remind you that we have the frontline forces. Uh, models, if you're looking for um, education resources for your facilities, um, we have the frontline uh, forces modules and there's new modules in there for the EVS. Um, lots of great, amazing work from uh, um, some of our departments that are working on getting you guys the resources that you guys are requesting. Um, another resource that she dropped into the chat was the Vivint Health modules. It was released for those that are in Wisconsin. It was released through the GovD. Um, through DHS um, to encourage people to use. It's free of charge. You can um, receive a report. It teaches uh, residents, families, and or staff on um, their RSV, pneumonia, and COVID-19 vaccinations. It gives you science-based information. And then we also put into the chat the CMS EBP changes. There, we want to remind you that we have an EBP um, toolkit on our website and um, then the PDF of the presentation as well as the event valuation. Um, before we conclude, I want to tell you about our next presentation. You should join us for our Nursing Home Leadership Roundtable on Wednesday, August 28th, same time, same place, where we'll continue our series on turning deficiencies into efficiencies, and we'll have an, incent uh, an insightful session on environmental rounding. Um, we have a passionate, um, person that is going to be speaking, Mr. Ed, Mr. Blake, the sanitarian from the state of Michigan survey team. And we're really excited to offer this education and have you be able to answer any of your questions that you might have for him. While he does work in Michigan, it will still 
apply because they have to follow the same CMS rule. So we're looking forward to that presentation. Thank you all for present pre participating. We look forward to seeing you back and we appreciate Ms. Jana and of course, Ms. Kim in presenting these topics. It was very informed um, topics and I just love when you guys present. Thanks, bye.